Kathy, and this is Karen Renee. I'm Susan, and this is Brooke the Colt. And lengthen that. Yeah. Right here, right here. I love you, my little pony. American kids experienced a world filled with unique activities that today's youth might not recognize. The era of the 80s was a treasure trove of simple joys, from spending hours mastering the Rubik's Cube to eagerly waiting for Saturday morning cartoons. Do you remember the excitement of renting VHS tapes from the local video store or cruising around the block on roller skates? Those were the days when trading stickers and playing with action figures ruled the playground. As we journey back in time, join us as we uncover the second part of 20 Things from the 1980s, kids today no longer do. These colorful cubes with their six colored sides were more than just a toy. They were a test of patience, logic, and problem-solving skills. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton unraveled the mysteries of gravity, but could he have unraveled the mysteries of Rubik's Cube? Kids and adults spent countless hours twisting and turning the squares, determined to get all the colors on the same side. There were even competitions to see who could solve the cube the fastest. Some folks even developed their solving methods with catchy names like Beginner's Luck or Friedrich Method. The craze wasn't just about competition, though. The satisfaction of finally cracking the code and achieving that perfect six-sided color match was a reward in itself. Today's kids have a world of digital games and instant gratification at their fingertips. But for many 80s kids, the Rubik's Cube was a reminder that sometimes the most rewarding challenges come in a simple, colorful package. Because the last twist of the Rubik's Cube falls into place, a lingering question arises whether other nostalgic treasures from the 1980s have faded into obscurity. Did Saturday mornings with their sugary cereal and colorful cartoons hold a special magic? Forget sleeping in. The allure of brightly colored cartoons and a giant bowl of sugary cereal was simply too strong. Networks like ABC, NBC, and CBS would dedicate hours of airtime to animated shows, creating a lineup that became a pop culture phenomenon. He-Man, She-Ra, Teenage Mutant, Ninja Turtles, Gem, and the Holograms, these were just a few of the iconic characters that graced the small screen. Kids would gather around the TV, cereal bowls balanced precariously on their laps, completely absorbed in the adventures unfolding before them. The commercials, filled with the latest toys and sugary treats, only added to the excitement. This Saturday morning ritual wasn't just about cartoons. It was about shared experiences. Kids would discuss the shows with their friends on Monday morning. Trading theories and favorite characters, now cartoons are available 24-7 on demand. But there's something special about that specific time slot the shared experience and the taste of sugary cereal that makes Saturday morning cartoons a cherished memory of growing up in the 1980s. Back then, car rides were a different experience. Today, buckling up is second nature, but back then, seatbelt use wasn't universally enforced. Kids, especially in the back seat, might hop in the car without a second thought, ready for the freedom of the open road. Well, as open as it gets from the back seat window, while some cars had those annoying buzzers that went off if you weren't buckled, they weren't everywhere yet. Parents might remind you to buckle up, but it wasn't always strictly enforced. This led to a lot of kids sprawled out in the back seat, gazing out the window, or even climbing between the seats to chat with siblings. Looking back, it seems pretty risky. Gratefully, times have changed. Seatbelt laws are stricter, and cars themselves are much safer. Kids today grow up knowing that buckling up is the most important step before setting off on any adventure. While those free-roaming backseat days might seem nostalgic, the safety benefits of wearing a seatbelt are undeniable. Do you remember the thrill of Friday night movie nights? It wasn't just about the movie itself, but the entire experience that started at the video rental store. These havens of entertainment boasted row upon row of colorful VHS tapes, each one promising an exciting adventure or hilarious comedy. Picking a movie wasn't just a decision, it was an adventure. Browsing the aisles, you'd encounter eye-catching box art featuring action heroes, sci-fi aliens, and goofy cartoon characters. Sometimes you might even snag a free popcorn bag or browse through movie soundtracks on cassette tapes. The decision itself could take forever, with arguments raging between wanting the latest blockbuster or revisiting a childhood favorite. Renting a VHS meant a commitment, 
Once you popped that tape into the VCR, you were locked in for the next two hours unless you accidentally rewound too fast and messed up the movie. There was no fast-forwarding to skip commercials or rewinding a scene a million times. It was a simpler time, forcing you to truly focus on the movie and appreciate it in its entirety. But amidst the excitement of movie nights, what other electronic wonders defined the 80s? Did Speak Ant Spell's synthesized voice guide a generation toward a love of learning? That era saw a rise in electronic toys, and Speak and Spell was one of the most popular. This handheld device wasn't just fun. It was billed as a revolutionary way to learn spelling and vocabulary. Imagine a little yellow computer with a friendly voice that could quiz you on words and even spell them out for you, letter by letter. For kids, Speak and Spell was a captivating companion. It challenged you to spell words of increasing difficulty, keeping you engaged with its synthesized voice and light-up display. Getting a word right came with a rewarding chime, while a gentle try again prompted you to keep practicing. Some kids even mastered the trick of typing in their secret messages for the Speak and Spell to pronounce. While Speak and Spell might seem primitive compared to today's educational apps and tablets, it sparked a love of learning for many 80s kids. It was a way to interact with technology and improve your vocabulary, all wrapped up in a bright yellow package. Back then, there wasn't Spotify or instant downloads. If you wanted your favorite jams on a portable playlist, you grabbed a blank cassette tape and camped out by the radio. The key was timing and precision. Hitting the record button just as the DJ faded out of the song and stopping it before the next one began was an art form. Sometimes you might even risk talking over the radio host with an enthusiastic, this is my jam, to mark the beginning of a song for later editing. Creating a mixtape wasn't a solitary activity. It was a way to share your musical taste with friends. You might spend hours crafting the perfect track list, a mix of chart-topping hits, hidden gems, and maybe even a slow song for that special someone. The finished product, proudly labeled with markers and stickers, became a treasured possession, a reflection of your musical identity. These landline telephones had a circular dial with numbers, and making a call meant using your finger to spin the dial around to each number. The faster you spun, the faster the dial went burring, creating a satisfying whirring sound. But dialing wasn't always smooth sailing. Overshooting a number meant letting the dial spin all the way back around, wasting precious seconds, especially if you were calling long distance. And forget about texting. If you wanted to leave a message for someone who wasn't home, you had to rely on an answering machine, a separate device that played a recording of your voice. While they've been replaced by mobile technology, rotary phones remain a reminder of a simpler time when a phone call was a more deliberate and sometimes even exciting act. Yet, amidst the simplicity of communication, what other interactive wonders captivated the imaginations? Did Teddy Ruxpin's animated tales weave a tapestry of childhood magic? Teddy Ruxpin wasn't your average stuffed bear. This high-tech plush toy featured a built-in cassette player and expressive eyes and mouth. Pop in a Teddy Ruxpin cassette tape and your furry friend will come alive, telling stories, singing songs, and even interacting with you through pre-recorded dialogue. Teddy Ruxpin wasn't just a storyteller, he was a friend. Kids would cuddle up with him, listening to his adventures and responding to his prompts. The moving eyes and mouth added another layer of magic, making Teddy Ruxpin feel like a real character. Today's interactive toys are much more sophisticated, but Teddy Ruxpin holds a special place in the hearts of 80s kids. He was a reminder that even a plush toy could be a source of comfort, fun, and imaginative adventures. Imagine a book where you control the story. These interactive novels threw regular storytelling out the window. Instead of passively following a character's journey, you were in the driver's seat, making choices that shaped the plot. Here's how it worked. At key points in the story, the book would pause and present you with two or sometimes more choices. Maybe you'd stumble upon a mysterious fork in the road. Turn left to explore the dark forest or turn right and follow the sunny path. Each choice led you to a different section of the book filled with new challenges, characters, and cliffhangers. These books were more than just stories. They were adventures in decision-making. Every choice has consequences forcing you to consider the risks and rewards before turning the page. 
They sparked a love of reading and encouraged critical thinking in a way that traditional novels couldn't quite match. Stepping into a bustling arcade was like entering a wonderland of flashing lights, joystick clicks, and the iconic bleeps and bloops of classic games. These havens of electronic entertainment were packed with rows of arcade cabinets, each one a portal to a different virtual world. Games like Pac-Man with its maze-chasing, dot-munching action and Space Invaders where you blasted rows of pixelated aliens were the rock stars of the arcade scene. The competition was fierce. Kids and adults would vie for the highest scores, their joystick skills on full display as they battled for bragging rights. These days, kids have powerful gaming consoles and online multiplayer options at their fingertips. But arcades offered a unique experience, a social space dedicated to pure, unadulterated video game fun. For 80s kids, the sights, sounds, and competitive spirit of the arcade remain a cherished memory of a golden age of gaming. Amidst the pixelated adventures, what other relics of the past sparked joy and connection? Did the art of handwritten letters weave heartfelt communication in a world before instant messaging? Remember a time before instant messaging and text alerts? Snail mail was king. If you wanted to chat with a friend who didn't live nearby, you grabbed a pen and some colorful paper. You waited patiently for your message to be delivered. By an actual snail, well, not really, but it sure felt slow compared to today's lightning-fast communication. Writing a letter was a thoughtful process. You poured your heart out on paper, sharing jokes, secrets, and doodles. Decorating your letters with stickers, glitter, and colorful pens was half the fun. The anticipation of waiting for a reply added to the excitement. Imagine the thrill of checking your mailbox and finding a decorated envelope addressed to you in your best friend's handwriting. Snail mail wasn't just for friends, it was how you connected with family too. Sending a letter to grandma and grandpa filled them in on your latest adventures, and receiving a handwritten card from them felt more personal than any digital message ever could. The original My Little Ponies of the 80s had glittery bodies, long, brushable hair, and unique symbols on their flanks. Each pony had a distinct personality, too, from the leader, Twilight Sparkle, yes, the same name as the later generation, to the mischievous Pinkie Pie. The fun went beyond just collecting the ponies. These toys sparked imaginative play. Kids would create elaborate stories for their My Little Ponies, sending them on adventures in pony-sized houses, castles, and even special rainbow-colored carriages. The bright colors and friendly faces made them the perfect companions for tea parties, pretend adventures, and hours of imaginative fun. While My Little Pony has gone through many transformations over the years, the spirit of the 1980s ponies lives on. For many kids who grew up in that era, these toys were more than just plastic figures. They were loyal companions on a journey through a land of imagination. The simple design, vibrant colors, and focus on friendship left a lasting impression, making the original My Little Pony a cherished part of childhood. In the 1980s, MTV was a cultural phenomenon. It wasn't about reality shows or endless reruns. MTV stood for music television, and that's exactly what it delivered, a non-stop stream of music videos. Michael Jackson's Moonwalk in Billie Jean, Madonna's bold fashion choices in Like a Virgin, or Bon Jovi's hairspray-fueled anthems, these were just a few of the music video moments that captivated audiences in the 80s. MTV wasn't just passive entertainment, it was a trendsetter. It launched the careers of countless musicians and introduced new musical styles to the world. Kids would race home after school to catch the latest video premieres, eagerly memorizing the catchy tunes and copying the outrageous dance moves. Nowadays, music videos are everywhere online, but there is something special about the shared experience of watching them on MTV. After the music fades on MTV, memories of iconic music videos and shared viewing experiences come to an end. But did the simplicity of Fisher Price's Little People playsets build worlds of imagination in a time before complex action figures? These brightly colored plastic figures, along with their accompanying playsets, offered endless possibilities for imaginative play. Unlike today's action figures with intricate details, Little People was all about simplicity. Their cheerful faces and blocky bodies encouraged kids to use their imaginations. 
The playsets themselves were like miniature worlds, featuring everything from charming houses with opening doors to bustling farms with barns and fences. The beauty of little people was their versatility. Kids could create elaborate stories, send their little figures on grocery runs in the supermarket playset, attend a school play in the classroom setting, or even take a vacation to the special airport playset complete with a tiny airplane. The possibilities were endless, limited only by a child's imagination. Imagine a world before smartphones and voice-activated assistants. If you wanted to capture a quick thought, a funny message, or even a song idea, you reached for a trusty cassette tape and a recorder. These portable devices, often clunky and prone to tangles, were the way to record your own audio adventures. Recording yourself wasn't just for practical reasons. It could be a hilarious exercise. Kids would goof around, impersonate their teachers, or sing silly songs, all captured on the grainy audio quality of a cassette tape. Sometimes these recordings even became a time capsule of sorts, a way to preserve a funny joke, a special birthday message, or even the awkward mumblings of a young child. Sharing these homemade recordings with friends was half the fun. Passing around a cassette tape filled with your greatest hits was a way to bond and create inside jokes. Listening back to these recordings years later could be a cringe fest, but also a reminder of how your voice, and maybe your sense of humor, has changed over time. Now voice recording is effortless with smartphones and digital devices, but cassette tapes offered a different kind of experience, a tangible way to capture a moment in your own voice. Before the internet offered endless entertainment at your fingertips, magazines were a portal to different worlds. Two iconic options for kids were Highlights for Children and Mad Magazine. Highlights was a treasure trove of age-appropriate fun, packed with colorful illustrations, hidden pictures, and engaging stories. It sparked curiosity and a love of reading. The goofus and gallant feature, highlighting good and bad behavior in relatable scenarios, offered many lessons in a fun way. And who could forget the ever-popular purple panda puzzles challenging young minds with riddles and brain teasers? Mad Magazine, on the other hand, catered to a slightly older crowd. Known for its wacky parodies of pop culture, politics, and even classic literature, Mad offered a hilarious and often irreverent take on the world. As the pages of highlights for children or Mad Magazine are turned, a sense of nostalgia for childhood reading adventures settles in. Nonetheless, did the thrill of unsupervised, trick-or-treating adventures ignite imaginations and fuel friendships on Halloween nights past? In the 80s, trick-or-treating was a different experience. Unlike today, where parents often accompany their little ghosts and goblins, kids back then ventured out in packs, their imaginations running wild with every spooky house and decorated doorstep. Costumes were often homemade or hand-me-downs, but creativity reigned supreme. A bedsheet transformed you into a ghost, some green paint made you a fearsome monster, and a cardboard box became your trusty spaceship. The goal was to collect as much candy as possible, filling your pillowcases or plastic pumpkins with a sugary bounty. The thrill of the unknown added to the excitement. You never knew what awaited you behind each door. A grumpy homeowner, a bowl overflowing with candy bars, or maybe even a prankster with a bucket of shaving cream. A slightly risky but common occurrence in the 80s. The journey itself was part of the fun, with kids comparing costumes, sharing spooky stories, and trading candy along the way. Cabbage Patch Kids were more than just exciting toys. Each doll was unique, with different skin tones, eye colors, and a mane of yarn hair that begged to be styled, or maybe even chopped into outrageous 80s mullets. The adoption aspect of Cabbage Patch Kids added to their mystique. Kids wouldn't just pick a doll off the shelf, they'd choose one based on personality and looks, then proudly hold their adoption papers, a whole ceremony in a cardboard box. Playing with Cabbage Patch Kids wasn't just about pretend parenting. These dolls sparked imaginative adventures. Kids would create elaborate stories for their Cabbage Patch families, sending them to school, on vacations, or even forming their own rock bands. If you wanted to share your jams with the world, or at least your entire neighborhood, you cranked up your trusty boombox. These portable giants, powered by bulky batteries, were the ultimate symbol of portable music power. 
Imagine lugging around a box with oversized speakers and a cassette player, its antenna telescoping proudly into the air. Hitting play on your favorite mixtape, the music would blare out, filling the streets with the sounds of pop, rock, or maybe even your latest breakdancing beats. Boomboxes weren't just for personal use. They were the life of the party, blasting tunes at backyard barbecues, impromptu dance sessions on the sidewalk, or even serenades under someone's window, a classic 80s move. The bigger the boombox, the cooler you were, or at least that was the unwritten rule. With the boombox belts out tunes to the rhythm of outdoor adventures, memories of music-filled streets flood in. But did the jazzercise craze bring joy and rhythm to fitness routines in a neon-colored world of sweatbands and leg warmers? Back there, fitness wasn't just about hitting the gym or running laps. It was about getting fit and having fun at the same time, and that's where jazzercise came in. This high-energy workout phenomenon combined dance moves inspired by jazz with aerobic exercise, all set to upbeat music. Imagine a room filled with leg warmers, neon headbands, and people of all ages bopping, kicking, and lunging to the sounds of pop and disco. Jazzercise wasn't about being the strongest or the fastest. It was about feeling the rhythm and letting loose. The instructors, often sporting colorful leotards and big smiles, were the ultimate motivators. They'd guide you through routines with catchy names like Grapevine and Jumping Jacks, all designed to get your heart pumping and your body moving. In the modern world, fitness options are diverse, from high-intensity workouts to yoga studios. But Jazzercise offered something unique, a chance to combine exercise with pure, uninhibited fun. For many 80s participants, those neon-clad Jazzercise classes remain a reminder that getting fit can be a joyful, music-filled experience.